Hello everybody, today on To The Garage, we're going to look at XK8 ECU repairs. And this is one where a subscriber to the channel, Matt, thank you so much Matt, super subscriber, um, sent in quite some time ago now an excellent little article on how to repair your ECU for the common cause issues. And that article will, when this video comes out, be on the channel. So if you want to uh, see the original version of this from Matt, then just go to www.tothegarage.co.uk and check out the tab at the top of the website that says XK8 Bible and other useful documents. And in there, follow the list down and you'll find Matt's article. But I thought I'd supplement that with a little video version of the article because not everybody knows um, the secret of where is the ECU in the XK8 and how to get to them. So engine ECU, we're going in. So we're under the bonnet of my 1996 XK8 UK spec right hand drive XK8. First thing, remove the cover on the left hand side of the car to reveal this compartment, which has got our bonnet lock, um, accessory um, power, and it's got a couple of relay boxes, a fuse box, and also this big box which is all sealed up now this is something on my car that's not standard i've kind of already moved on from things so i'm going to have to explain this contains the ecu storage rack and fan cooling system and it's normally held down with four that you need to get off and two more at the back um, screws and they are these tamper proof m6s tamper proof should be said in inverted commas because they're relatively easy to get out but hopefully what you can see is it's actually for a straight blade screwdriver and if you're turning clockwise i.e tighten right simulate there are flat surfaces to go against if you go undo anti-clockwise, there are ramp surfaces which push the screwdriver back out. And that is obviously a warranty related thing. They don't want their customers to play around in here. And to some extent, it's a security thing because the identity of the vehicle is partially within the ECU and partially within the instrument panel and partially with the stamped numbers. So this is one of the elements which could be used to um, take the identity of the vehicle and put it on another one. Anyway, at 23 years old, we're not really worried about that. So when you're removing these for the very first time, as I did, you need to get them out. And the technique is put a strong, broad, straight blade screwdriver in them, lean down with literally all of your weight. I like to rest my chin on it. and. Uh, Use that and a sudden movement to the left, anti-clockwise. As soon as you start them moving, because they're in brass ferrules, they'll come out really nicely and easily. Um, you've just got to break their grip. Once they're out, like me, I recommend you put in cap heads. So I've got stainless steel cap heads or Allen bolts, whichever you prefer, in their place. Just means if you ever want to go back in there, it's easier and they look pretty. There we go. So I've got M6 by 25 stainless steel cap headed bolts. You only need them to be uh, 10 or a 15 mil long that's excessive but it doesn't matter because they're straight through you can put in as long a bolt as you like so you will find 
four of those in line of sight. Just because the way the lid is shaped, you need a long Allen key or a nice T-handled one like this. The short little cheap one or the, um, the multi-sets you get that look like a Swiss Army knife aren't really suitable. And as always, I'm chucking everything in my little trusty whoops, stainless steel magnetic tray. Really useful for not losing things underneath the car. Okay, so with four undone, you can lift from the front edge. Probably better to take that off first, a few box cover. Pull forward a little bit as you do so, and wriggle this out. And there you are, that's the lid. It's got these two bits of foam here and two here, which hold the units below into place and stop them from jiggling around too much. As always, I like to look at the plastics, because I'm a very sad man. And this is 96.6. So these tools were dressed in June of 96. Very, very early car. There is a seal round here. Um, it's sort of a felt, more than a foam, or it's turned to felt with compression. Um, it doesn't get jets of water frying at it, so it's not super critical. But if it was broken or crumbling, it'd be worth putting some new foam sealant around that. Just some uh, door draft excluder would do the job if you haven't got access to automotive foams. And there we are. We are now inside the ECU storage area. And I can literally just pick this unit up and move it. And as you can see, Bosch transmission control. So this is what's working your gearbox. This is the thing we are programming by doing a hard reset and then teaching the gearbox what to do. This is what decides on whether it's able to kick down or not, what puts us into limp home mode on the gearbox, all sorts of clever stuff like that. The box behind is your engine ECU. Whoops. Just gonna drop that back into his correct compartment. Just slots in. And there's a big metal lever here which you can pull off and then pull off the big connector. If I wanna go into here and fetch out this unit, then my choices are I can either take the scuttle off, which allows access to this back half of the um, cover for the ECU box and then you can open the thing up entirely and that will slide out the back and up. If not, then you're undoing some more tamper-proof nuts in order to take this, this bracket off and then you can pull it out that way. Underneath here are computer fans, which are cooling this bay because these are computers and they're running and they're gonna get warm. There is a tube here and this tube goes through to the interior of the car and connects up with where the path of the air conditioning system is. So if the air conditioning's on, it's putting a little bit of air from the air conditioning into here. And the fan in the bottom is extracting that air and keeping the flow through this unit. So now you know where the ECU is. Let's revert back to Matt's brilliant article. So in Matt's specific case, the reason he wanted to remove his ECU and do work on it was he was getting all sorts of strange faults. 
Um, he was having the engine basically just stall after he'd started the engine. He was uh, putting a code reader on it, and every time he started up, he seemed to get a different code. He had ECU communication over OBD2 not working, which basically says the OBD read socket isn't working properly. He had error codes for the camshaft sensor and error codes for the crankshaft sensor, but not at the same time, and sometimes they were there and sometimes they weren't. He had error codes for coils, and they were moving from one bank to the other and from coil to coil on different restarts. And you wouldn't expect all the coils to go down randomly and then heal themselves. So he was getting all these sorts of random faults. All of these things caused Matt to suspect the ECU. But the first checks are, get out the ECU unit and just check that all the connectors are still in position and tight. Although it's got all that sponge around it, it can twitch around and over time connections become dislodged. So check the easy stuff. Check that the cooling fans are still running inside that bay. You can generally hear them. When you turn the ignition off, you'll hear them wind down. Or you can hear them if you listen underneath the glove box. If the fans aren't running, then things get hot and all sorts of errors can occur. Having eliminated those, the very easiest of options, in theory, is just swap the ECU. But the reality of that is about £5,000 for a new one from Jaguar. Or you get a, a second hand one from another vehicle that's known to work. But remember that the ECU knows the VIN number of the car that it's in. And it knows all the serial numbers of all the modules that are attached to it. So although it could be made to work, it needs Jaguar level of um, computer equipment and programming and stuff to get them all to shake hands with each other again. And you're back to taking it to a dealer to do that, and you're going to clock up a big bill. If you're not a competent uh, circuit board repairman, there are ECU repairers out there advertising online. Or, as Matt suggests quite cunningly, if you find somebody who's maybe a TV repairman, particularly of old, then they're going to have all the right skills to look at uh, what's inside the ECU and have a fair stab at trying to fix it for you. Besides some other ribbon connectors, most of what's inside the ECU is pretty much solid state and hard to see how it go wrong. However, it does contain electrolytic com capacitors and these are basically um, constructed in the same way as batteries and can leak and degrade over time. So. Matt has circled in this diagram the location of those, and it is worth replacing all of them. This is not an expensive task, and Matt has included here the shopping list he, he used online, and the whole thing came to about £10. Uh, just be careful to order the right sorts of things. This is not necessarily the parts you should order, and if you're not good at recognising uh, the capacitors and capacitances, again, get a friend who's good with that sort of stuff, a radio ham, TV repairman, to look at it for you, and they'll order up the parts. Once you've got replacement capacitors, remove the old ones, one at a time, so that you don't get disorientated, forget which one goes where, be very careful of getting the polarities right, etc. Below the uh, capacitors, if there has been any leakage, the circuit boards are really fine and it's really easy for the acid to make short circuits. So that might need cleaning up, uh, getting rid of the corrosion, correcting things below there. But it's just simple work of a magnifying glass and uh, cotton buds with alcohol to identify if there is any damage. When soldering back in the new capacitors, Matt gives tips on checking the polarity, which is marked on the circuit board and indicated by the white stripe on the side of the capacitor, 
and again checking over that you've got the right capacitors of a decent brand when you're installing so that is really all we can share on this one Matt managed to cure his problems by replacing those capacitors and getting at the ECU and replacing it is not that difficult uh, check out the article which has obviously um, a little bit more detail in text form but this is one where if you're not feeling confident about repairing the circuit boards then again phone a friend is the top tip when you're refitting you just want to make sure uh, the back edge you can see it's got a little bit of foam on the outside goes under the back half of the box lid which is still attached we hope you've enjoyed this episode of secrets of the xk8 and just like to remind you that all of the photos the images and the uh, concept behind this is matt's not mine so all credit goes to him uh, I just put this video together to assist with it. I'm going to put a link in the description below to the page on the website where Matt's article lives. Uh, please check that out. If you want to help the channel, then just subscribe, share, um, get involved with the conversation, consider buying a sticker, all those sorts of good things. And we'll see you again soon on To The Garage.